Today's integral looks absolutely terrifying. I mean, seriously. It's the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the negative log x times the inverse tangent of x divided by x. So yeah, there is a lot going on here, but it turns out that there is a really nice way to tame this monster and reduce it to something very familiar as well as quite friendly. So we're going to call the integral i for reference purposes and we're going to make use of a substitution that comes in quite handy when dealing with the arc tangent integrals. So the substitution I'm talking about is letting x, oh terribly sorry about that, letting x equal to 1 by u. Now this implies that dx equals negative 1 by u squared du. And as x approaches 0 from the right, u will approach positive infinity. And as x approaches infinity, u has to approach 0. Okay, cool. So that means our integral i in the u world translates to the integral from infinity, oh, again, terribly sorry, the integral from infinity to 0 of, now x is 1 by u, so that is u to the negative 1, correct? And this is being raised to the negative log 1 by u exponent. And we have to multiply all of the stuff by the inverse tangent of 1 by u. And divide all of this by 1 by u. And the differential element translated to negative 1 by u squared du. Now we can get rid of this negative sign if we switch up the limits of integration so that it doesn't look that weird anymore. So we have the integral from 0 to infinity now. And we don't have that pesky negative sign to worry about. Now, look closely here. You have negative log 1 by u. And using the properties of the logarithm, we know that if we reciprocate the argument, we introduce an extra negative sign. So the two negative signs will cancel out, and you'll have log x, uh, log u, as the exponent. And you have u to the negative 1 to the log u. So you can write all of this more in a more compact sense as u to the negative log u. And one of the u's cancelled out over here as well, pretty nicely. So finally, we can write our integral i as the integral from 0 to infinity of u to the negative log u times the inverse tangent of 1 by u divided by u du. Okay, cool. So because u and x are just dummy variables, we can rename all the u's back to x's. And notice that there is a very similar structure here between the integral we start off with and the integral we have right now. It's x to the negative log x times the inverse tangent of 1 by x divided by x dx. So I've written out both structures for the integral i for comparison purposes. And notice that if we add both of them, we get 2 times i on the left. And because both integrations are being carried out on the right half of the real line, we can make use of the linearity of the integral operator and just combine them. And we have the integral from 0 to infinity of, now, wait a second, you can also factor out an x to the negative log x divided by x term. And we're left with the inverse tangent of x plus the inverse tangent of 1 by x, which is quite wonderful. It, it's really neat, it's really nice because the inverse tangent of x plus the inverse tangent of the reciprocal of x equals pi by 2 as long as, you know, x is a positive real number. So, yeah, this is really neat. This is a very pleasant surprise to the solution development we have here because it makes our lives so much easier. So this implies that i equals, uh, multiplying the equation by 1 half, of course, i equals 1 half of the integral from 0 to infinity of, wait, we have this pi by 2 term outside, of x to the negative log x divided by x dx. And now the substitution to perform is pretty much clear as day. We have this log x as well as a 1 by x dx term, so we could just let log x equal to t which implies that x equals e to the t. And this further implies that dx equals uh, 1 by x dx equals dt. So this implies that i in the t world is the, is wait, it's pi by 4 times the integral from where to where exactly? Well, as x approaches 0, t will approach negative infinity. 
So we have the integral from negative to positive infinity of e to the t uh, to the negative log x. And negative log x is just negative t, right? And this 1 by x dx becomes the differential element. So we're left with pi by 4 times the integral from negative to positive infinity of e to the negative t squared dt. And this is the good old Gaussian boy, which I've never really evaluated here on the channel using the traditional technique. And by traditional technique, I mean, you know, switching the polar coordinates and all that. I've evaluated it using Feynman's trick, and that was a pretty wild ride. So yeah, that was a really cool video. Link in, in the description below. And I'm not going to evaluate the Gaussian using polar coordinates today either. There's a much more satisfying way of evaluating it. And it starts off by letting t squared equal to some new variable. Let's call it z for a change. So let t squared equal to z, which implies that dt equals 1 by 2 times square root z dz. And this implies that i equals, wait a second. One thing we should have done before the transformation was note that because we're integrating an even function of t, instead of integrating from negative to positive infinity, we could just integrate from 0 to infinity and double the results. So we have pi by 2 being multiplied by our Gaussian boy here. So under our transformation from the t world to the z world, we have i being equal to pi by 2 times the integral from, again, 0 to infinity of e to the negative t, and you have this factor of 1 by 2 as well because of the differential element, times z to the negative 1 half, which we recognize as the gamma function evaluated at 1 half. Now I know what you're thinking, wait, don't we need uh, the value of the Gaussian integral itself to figure out gamma 1 by 2? Well, that's not exactly the case. We can evaluate gamma 1 by 2 independent of the Gaussian, by using Euler's wonderful reflection formula. So we have gamma z times gamma 1 minus z being equal to pi times the cosecant of pi times z. So if you let z equal to 1 half, then you get gamma 1 half times gamma 1 minus 1 half, which is 1 half, equal to pi times the cosecant of pi by 2. And the cosecant of pi by 2 is just 1, so this implies that the square of the gamma function evaluated at 1 half equals pi, which implies that gamma 1 half equals the square root of pi. See, wasn't that a wonderful way to evaluate uh, gamma 1 half? So this implies that I, our terrifying integral, which turned out to be not so terrifying at all, evaluates out quite nicely to pi times the square root of pi divided by 4. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.